Hello and welcome to CSGB at Home. My name is Andrew Patrick. I'm the Director of Political Co Communications at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. Uh, I want to thank you for watching. Uh, today we're talking about funding and investment uh, in, in some efforts to reduce gun violence. We are so lucky to be joined by our CSGB and Ed Fund Senior Policy Analyst, Ari Davis, and our student organizer in Tennessee, Sierra Hinkson. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thanks so much for having us, Andrew. Yeah, great to be here. So we've been hearing a lot uh, out of Washington and out of state capitals about uh, funding for community violence interruption programs and these initiatives uh, that address community violence at their core. Uh, they're community operated and they they are uh, dealt deal with this uh, epidemic at the ground level uh, to try to prevent gun violence from happening uh, in these communities. Uh, we've seen there's a lot of talk about the infrastructure reconciliation bill having a lot of funds for this. The Biden administration has put in historic commitment uh, to funding for these type of types of efforts. Uh, there's an appropriations bill making its way through the House uh, that has about 215 million for community and youth violence prevention and community violence interruption uh, funds. Uh, and then right now going on is the special session in Virginia, which we're a part of the coalition in Virginia uh, to fund peace and, and, and asking that state legislature and governor to really make an investment in these areas. So Ari, uh, you, you know a lot of the details about these types of programs and why it's so important to invest in them. Uh, can you tell us briefly uh, what CBI community violence interruption programs do and, and how they work? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So yeah, community violence intervention programs um, kind of encompass a wide range of community-based um, uh, programs to interrupt cycles of violence, right? And so there's a lot of different models that have been shown really over the last you know, 20, 30 years in a number of cities uh, to be effective um, at really engaging the individuals who are at highest risk to violence. So a lot of these individual, individuals have also been victimized um, and, and victims of violence as well and provide supports to, to interrupt those cycles of retaliatory violence. Um, so they provide, um, you know, uh, trauma-informed care. They, they've helped connect um, usually youth, but individuals to, to, to social services and, and, and jobs uh, supports within the community. And so the evidence for these programs, um, you know, shows that they can be really effective at, at reducing violence um, in the cities that we see, um, you know, high rates of violence. Uh, one of the, the challenges with these programs is that there's really been a lack of funding for them. Um, so, you know, they're small nonprofits, they're, they're doing the work on the ground, they've been doing it for years. And, um, you know, there really hasn't been an investment, um, except for, you know, a couple of states, there really hasn't been, there's been no federal investment and there really hasn't been, um, you know, large investments at the state or, or city level in most cities. And so what we're seeing now is this kind of unprecedented um, advocacy um, for um, CVI efforts and really a willingness um, from the Biden administration and, and, and members of Congress to embrace this as a vital component of public safety, right? And, 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 and placing it um, in, in tandem with kind of our traditional public safety strategies. And so the Biden administration, um, as you said, Andrew, has, has really committed to this and has hosted a number of kind of technical assistance and training um, sessions and is working with um, leading experts and researchers um, and uh, leadership in, a number, in 15 cities with, with some of the highest rates of violence to um, really roll out um, effective community violence intervention programs. Um, in addition to that, um, the, uh, the administration is calling on, uh, you know, really allocating funds for these programs. And so there's, there's kind of three buckets where, where these funds can, are available now and can become available to depend on um, religious and past. And so um, the, the, the recovery funds for, for the coronavirus, um, it, there's, you know, millions of dollars that states and, and localities are receiving and will receive over the next um, three years. And those funds, the Biden administration has made clear that those funds can and should be used to address spikes in violence and to invest in community violence intervention programs. So that's a really exciting uh, development there where there's millions of dollars on the table right now that can be accessed by states and cities. Um, and then, you know, Andrew, you touched on two other avenues, um, you know, whether the, the, you know, in the House, um, you know, there's uh, $200 million in the budget proposed, or over $200 million for community violence intervention. And then there's a, a really exciting bill 
um, that's been introduced called the Break the Cycles of Violence Act. Um, and this year it is um, even stronger than it has been in past years. Um, and it would allocate $5 billion over eight years to address um, the, the community violence we're seeing in, in, in cities across America. So we're really excited about trying to, to, to get those pieces of legislation passed. And we're also excited about the, the funding that's currently available. Yeah, CSUV is uh, a part of the Invest in Us Coalition uh, run by CJAF. And uh, we're encouraging people to call their senators, uh, tell them to co-sponsor if they haven't already, the Break the Cycle of Violence Act, S2671. Uh, they need more co-sponsors co and let's get that, that vehicle moving because it is important to these, these programs and this type of funding. Uh, so there is an appetite at the, about this uh, at the federal level. There, there's an appetite in the White House and Congress. They want to get these funds and, and really invest, like you said, in these small nonprofit groups that have been chronically disinvested in uh, for, for decades and uh, really prop them up because that's where the real change happens. Uh, and, and at the state level, um, Sierra, you work in, in Tennessee. Uh, we've discussed with you uh, before on CSGV at Home. Uh, about some of the success and some of the setbacks that have happened at the locality and state level uh, in Tennessee. Um, how are, how's Tennessee using uh, the ARP funds that have been uh, promoted by, uh, I think, Nashville and Knoxville and some other cities there? Uh, and, and what is Tennessee doing with these type of funds? And hopefully we can see some success at the state level of Tennessee as well. Yeah. So, um, like you said, we've seen some some successes and some setbacks in Tennessee on the state on the state level. There's been some stalling with um, the legislation that could invest in violence prevention, but the ARP funds I think are going to be um, really helpful in kind of pushing that forward and um, getting the funding that these violence prevention um, programs will need. So we've seen some um, investments in some investments in Memphis. Actually, Memphis is part of the um, Community Violence Intervention Collaborative with the White House. So they have explicitly said that they plan to use ARP funds to hire and train more officers, as well as pay overtime, um, invest in youth programs, hire and train more individuals to work in violence interruption, and fund social um, services and wraparound services to connect victims of violence with um, different resources. So that's really exciting to see that coming out of Memphis. Um, We've also seen some action, some movement in Chattanooga, not necessarily with ARP funds, but they, the mayor has announced a plan to invest in community violence. Um, it's one of its priorities. So it's exciting that we now have these funds available. So that's something that um, hopefully can get moving there. Um, in Knoxville, we've had investments, not specifically also from ARP funds, but it's just exciting to see this trend of different cities in, ten in Tennessee um, like investing in, in community violence intervention and recognizing it as like a public health crisis. And um, in Nashville, they right now they are in the process of um, distributing grants through a, a separate program to different community organizations. Um, so it's exciting also to see that that traction picking up there. And um, those grants are being distributed, smaller grants. And now that we have these ARP funds, we're really hopeful that um, that too can be put towards these community groups and hopefully with a more um, grassroots approach because um, some of the criticisms from Nashville with the current grant um, distribution process that they're going through is that a lot of the money went towards like the police department and the health department. So we're hoping to see more investment in grassroots organizations, which um, ARP funds can go towards. And the good thing is that we have so many great examples of um, adequate funding and community violence intervention programs in other cities um, across the US that are, they're just kind of getting it right, which is which is great to see. Like in Philadelphia, for example, there's been um, some really amazing coalition work and advocacy from local organizations and elected officials and law enforcement. Um, so like real collaborative um, stakeholder investment into, well, stakeholder advocacy, I should say, um, into investment. So in Philadelphia, we've seen $20 million dedicated on the city level directly towards community violence intervention and another 30 on the um, state level. So that's really great to see. And I'm hoping that the trend can um, be mirrored in Nashville and, and throughout Tennessee. Yeah, it's, it's something that we hope that uh, 
quote unquote blue states and red states can get behind and in, in, in funding these efforts. Uh, and uh, let's watch the Tennessee legislature in uh, in uh, 2022, see where they where they go with this. They had some traction. Uh, didn't get across the finish line last year, but uh, it's something we should certainly keep an eye on. Uh, all right, like like we've been talking about, uh, Sierra just said, uh, we've seen successes. What are the barriers uh, to this this type of push? And, and what do you anticipate uh, being m more problems getting these type of funding initiatives passed uh, as as we, they continue to talk about it and, and look towards the future and getting these funds into the stakeholders to make a difference? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the barriers um, is is really communicating um, is, is that folks on the ground or folks in power, stakeholders at the, at the local and, and state level want to see immediate reductions in violence, right? Because they're seeing spikes in violence um, and, you know, the politics of, of having, you know, high rates of, of gun violence in your city is, uh, you know, is problematic for you as a, as a mayor or an elected official. Um, and so instead of thinking of like the long term of how can we really um, reduce this um, over the long span. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, city leadership is, is focused on, you know, kind of the traditional public safety approaches. And so I think that's going to be a barrier of, of messaging that community violence intervention can both interrupt cycles of violence today, but it also sets the ground, um, the, 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 the framework for uh, longer term reductions in violence. Um, the other thing I think is going to be a challenge is that as this money flows in, um, you know, everybody's going to want a piece of the pie, right? And it may sound like, you know, $5 million for a city is, is a lot of money to, to address for, for community balance intervention. But the reality is, um, you know, unless that $5 million is really narrowly focused on and providing supports to those who need it the most, um, I think it can quickly get diluted and, and, and the impacts of these programs, which we know can be effective, um, uh, may not be as um, as a parent. So I think that's another challenge that we're going to have to um, overcome as, you know, as more of these funds um, come down. So again, it's, I think it's just educating, um, educating folks on the power of uh, these programs and the evidence behind these programs and ensuring that the funds are directed specifically for um, uh, those programs and, and, um, and go to the people who need it the most. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, Sierra, we've seen uh, this summer uh, and th this year a rise in gun violence in cities across the across the country. Um, what do you say to the people who think that uh, the way to go is the traditional public safety investments as opposed to these grassroots uh, uh, efforts that we've discussed? And and why why do you see CBI as as a big part of the solution uh, to reducing these high level high rates of gun violence? Yeah, um, as we look at these increasing rates of gun violence, I think it's important that we rethink not only how we think about um, what public safety might look like, but what violence is and expand our definition, right? So if we want to eradicate violence at the root, we have to look at these root causes. In addition to, um, you know, like gun deaths, we see violence as evictions and food insecurity and a lack of quality health care, barriers to education, right? So um, all these are part of a historic trend of disinvestment in communities that disproportionately affect black and brown people and their communities. So we need that reinvestment in communities with methods that can center those impacted and connect them with the tools to thrive. And that investment looks like violence interruption and wraparound services for victims of violence. And we need these programs to be well-funded and consistently funded. And that's why we need investments um, on the state level and I'm sorry, on the federal level and then um, on the state level as well as city. Um, and community violence intervention programs can actually help to build legit police legitimacy by um, creating trust and that stakeholder collaboration within communities. And um, they work in tandem with traditional forms of public safety, right? We need community buy-in and we need police buy-in for these programs to work. And it's also important to consider um, as we see a spike in violence that um, historically addressing spikes in violence with hypervigilant policing um, and increased criminalization led to the era of mass incarceration that we still are experiencing the effects of today. 
So if we want to imagine a society that is um, built around safety and is built around um, communities thriving, we need to invest in programs that are proactive and don't react to violence, which is um, something that policing is, is kind of reactive method. So we need to think about what we can do to intervene and stop violence before it even occurs. Uh, absolutely right. Um, like these, we've seen uh, a, like a chronic disinvestment of the, in communities addressing the root causes for centuries, you could say. And it's going to take more than one appropriations bill, one and more than more administration. It's going to have to be a steady uh, push of putting funds into these efforts. Uh, and that's going to build a safer future as we go on preventative measures uh, and, and public safety measures that are necessary uh, as part of the solution to solving this uh, problem of gun violence. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, this is extremely important. We need to get these funds passed and implemented and uh, and make real change. Uh, and, and there are solutions here that can uh, really uh, help build safer communities and uh, safer cities. So thank you so much. Uh, and we will uh, we'll keep watching this. Thanks, Andrew.